Well, hey there, how you doing? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me here today. Hope you're well wherever you are. We've got some exciting news on the parallel reality front. This is a particularly interesting topic to me because it's something I got interested in a few years ago as a way to maybe possibly explain phenomena we see around us that are hard to explain, so-called paranormal phenomena, you know, like precognition and resonant viewing and UFO experiences and cryptid animals and things like this. The idea that there are parallel realities around us and that we get bleed through from these other realities. And when I've had conversations with physicists about this topic, they usually tell me that any belief in parallel realities and multiverses is just philosophy and metaphysics because it's not testable, right? It's not inherently testable. Well, wrong. There's another study out now. A group of scientists are studying the possibility of a parallel reality from research results from an experiment in Antarctica that suggests that there is a parallel reality that sort of is anti-symmetric to our own that goes in reverse. Everything is flipped around. Now, before we get into that, let's review a little bit about what we've learned so far about parallel realities and the whole idea behind this, the ideas behind it. If you've looked at my videos or you're familiar with this topic, you know, back in 1957, the first really main scientific formulation of the idea of parallel realities and multiverses came from our friend Hugh Everett, working as a graduate student at Princeton, where he proposed another way of looking at quantum mechanics, what he thought was a simpler version of quantum mechanics. If you're familiar with quantum mechanics, you're aware of this idea that the Schrodinger wave equation, which is the basis for modern quantum theory, suggests that matter is actually made up of probability waves and the energy is spread out in these waves, at least mathematically. And that what we, what we see as matter is actually equally well described as waves, waves of quantum energy. And the challenge has always been with quantum mechanics is everything, if everything that is a particle is also a wave, then why does the universe look so well defined to us? Why does it look solid? If everything is described by a huge range of possibilities, just imagine if you want to talk about that shapes and colors and dynamics and energy. If there's a huge range of possibilities associated with every object as described by the Schrodinger wave equation, why does it seem so uh, structured and, and, and formed the way it is? Now, this is known as the preferred basis problem because if subatomic particles are in superpositions, which means they're spread out over space and time. They're not in one location. They're in different positions simultaneously. Why do things look a certain way to us so objective and so solid and so fixed? This was an issue that really concerned you, Everett, because the quantum scientists at the time had to say that what was going on was that there was quantum world, quantum features, only at the subatomic level, at the macroscopic scale, things acted classically. And that would mean that you and I were classical objects too, and that when we observe quantum objects, they kind of collapse to a pointed state and lose their waveform. Well, to Hugh Everett, this didn't make any sense, because if you think about it, you and I are also quantum objects in the sense that we're made of organs and cells, molecules, atomic particles and subatomic particles, which are also quantum in nature. So if we're made up of subatomic particles, which are quantum and equally act as waveforms and particles, then why do we, why do we qualify as classical objects and not as quantum objects too? Hugh Everett proposed that the entire universe is a quantum object. You and I are quantum objects, and there is no cut. There is no decisive line that separates quantum and classical realities, that everything is in fact quantum, and that all the possibilities described by the wave equation, uh, the Schrodinger wave function, actually exist, and that you and I have multiple copies of ourselves that exist in all those realities too, which are perceiving slightly different versions than what 
you and I are perceiving here. They're different versions of ourselves. So whoever proposed that rather than there being any sort of wave form collapse, what you had instead was a multiplication of different versions of yourself. You could see them as different versions of you. However, you would want to see that. There's some obviously different ways of looking at that. And that was Hugh Everett's idea that everything is in fact quantum. There is only the Schrodinger wave function, which describes not just small things, but big things. Everything in the universe, everything behaves in a quantum way. And the reason it doesn't look spread out like a quantum waveform is because you're only seeing a slice of it at a time. And there's other versions of you since you're in a quantum waveform too what Schrodinger called jellyfishication, that actually exists, but your consciousness structures it into one slice at a time. Now, more recently, we have talked about the many interacting worlds model. The Everett version was the many worlds interpretation, as it's called. But the many interacting worlds model looks at it a little differently. It says that all these parallel realities already exist from the beginning of time, that there's a near infinite number of parallel realities to our own. But they're not being created at every moment from our observation like Hugh Everett uh, theorized. There isn't this splitting into different versions of reality where we split too. It's more that all these parallel realities actually exert a slightly repulsive effect on each other which recreates the quantum wave function. In other words, quantum mechanics itself is a function of parallel realities. How about that? It's sort of flipping the whole Everett idea around on its head. It does say that we're, there's still a huge number of parallel realities, as many as you can imagine. However, it's the interaction of those parallel realities when they're very similar through electron repulsion, if you have to know. And this is the work of uh, Hall, Wiseman, and Deckert. Uh, Howard Wiseman being from university in Australia and Bill Poirier from one of the universities in Texas who came up with this idea using so-called toy models which modeled fluid dynamics and they just sort of modeled this mathematically if you had parallel realities and they sort of had a fluid effect on each other surprisingly they came up again with all the features of quantum mechanics without any wave function creating it. It's sort of the inverse. It's the pressure of parallel realities which creates the waveforms that we see in subatomic particles here in our reality. And that's the many interacting worlds model, which also suggests for the first time that parallel realities interact. Because the key thing in Everett's model was that parallel realities never interact again because it's sort of proceeding through time. And he was working through it from a classical sense a traditional quantum, traditional quantum point of view. But this other view says that they do interact slightly and that could create things which science has yet to discover. Interactions between parallel realities. So that was a lot of fun to think about. And again, a little hard to show that it's exactly going on in reality because we didn't have any evidence. Well, that changed last year with Leo Brossard and her colleagues' research at Oak Ridge National Laboratories one of the former labs involved in the Manhattan Project in the 1940s and 50s, working with atomic weapons. Well, now they're looking at neutrons and missing neutrons in our universe, something that was first noticed by Lee and Yang working at Brookhaven National Labs in 1957. Lee and Yang were working with this idea of so-called charge parity violation, that you don't get the symmetry that we should see when you look at neutrinos, there are these missing right-handed neutrinos. Broussard and company are actually interested in looking at missing neutrons because neutrons, depending on how you measure them, decay at different rates, which shouldn't be happening according to current uh, particle physics. And the theory behind the missing neutron masses, about one in 100 neutrons, is missing from our universe. And to account for this, Broussard and others have suggested that there's a mirror universe where these neutrons are disappearing too quickly and coming back. It's sort of like a time-sharing project. The missing neutron mass would explain dark matter as we see it. And as it turns out, the amount of missing neutrons corresponds exactly to the amount of dark matter we find in our universe, about five to one. So Broussard and others have suggested 
that perhaps there's a mirror universe where there's five times as much matter as in our own universe. And the matter in that other parallel mirror universe, the mirrorverse, creates exactly the five times as much dark matter as we see in our universe. So that's one level where we could start seeing results. The tests are going on right now to see if you do get these missing neutrons in the amounts you would expect if this theory is correct. So there's some empirical evidence that could show that we're surrounded by one parallel reality. Now, this latest experiment comes from Antarctica, as I mentioned a few moments ago. And this comes from looking at neutrinos. And when they were reviewing data from this so-called ANITA experiment, Antarctic impulsive transient antenna experiment, they found the signatures, the energetic signatures of neutrinos that were not behaving the way neutrinos normally do in our universe. Neutrinos come from other galaxies. They come from our sun. And as you know, like about a billion go through your hand every second. They're so tiny, they never hit anything. But in this case, they found a couple neutrinos coming the wrong way through the center of the Earth. That's a long way for neutrinos to go without hitting anything, and that's a one in a million chance that that would happen. So the other alternative is that these are not ordinary neutrinos, that these are neutrinos that are actually antineutrinos. And where would antineutrinos be coming from? Of course, a parallel reality that is exactly anti, is symmetric to ours or is reversed. Everything in this reality would be reversed. And things would be backwards, time would be going backwards. It's like one of those Jimi Hendrix songs where all the sounds are going backwards. Even the Beatles played around with that occasionally. So this is a universe, another universe that's going in reverse of ours that's generating these missing neutrinos that we haven't been able to find. These are right-handed neutrinos. And no one knows where these neutrinos are coming from, from this experiment in Antarctica. So again, just like in the Leo Brassard neutron experiments at Oak Ridge, we don't have all the data yet to know conclusively that this is what's going on. But another interesting thing about this particular experiment is these antineutrinos perfectly explain the amount of dark matter we have in our universe, this missing matter that holds galaxies together, because the, electro the energetic signature of these neutrinos it's very small. It's like million billionths of a volt, which is about the equivalent of a tennis serve, according to what I understand about it. Same amount of energy. It's precisely the amount you would need to explain the dark matter in, that we see in our universe. So we have some very interesting connections here between this unexplained dark matter, which is the majority of matter in the universe, which no one's detected the source of yet, and mysterious neutrino particles that don't have any conventional explanation that would turn physics sort of upside down if it were true. And it's very exciting again, because we now we have two experiments that could show that parallel realities exist. And so the main point of this is the study of parallel realities has gone from being something that's just theoretical, where we're told that there's no way to verify it, metaphysics, philosophy, blah, blah, all that, to now experiments where it would be a reasonable explanation to say, since we can't explain the missing neutrons in the Oak Ridge experiments or these anti-neutrinos in these ANITA uh, experimental results from Antarctica, then the most reasonable thing to say, the most reasonable explanation would be parallel realities interacting with our own reality, which we're creating these sort of anomalies that we see in particle physics. So again, we'll have more to talk about this soon. This is sort of our brief summary of what this is all about, but I think it's very interesting. And again, it shows us that a lot of the phenomena we've been studying here could actually have a very sensible basis in a newer type of physics. Okay. Take care for now. Hope you enjoyed that. Feel free to put your comments in the box below. We'll talk to you later and take care. Bye.